And so what would it be like if we decided today and in these weeks ahead that we could say we want to be committed as Christians to, to following what we believe? And um, it, because everything that we say and do affects the world, but also everything that we believe and are living out has been affected by the world itself. Sometimes we've been infected by the world. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today because how we view God, how we view life, how we view our world have all been affected by what we see. And we've been influenced by the worldview of those around us, our friends, our families, maybe teachers, media, those in authority. They've all affected what we ourselves are, are thinking about and living out. And so your happiness, your way of life, your stress level, your confidence level, your success in the world are all determined by the worldview that you are currently living out in your life. Whether you have peace of mind, or whether you have hope, whether you have strength, all comes from the way that you see, the perspective you have on life. And so we're going to be talking about what it means to see things from God's perspective in this, uh, in this world, and, and what it means to uh, to, to have some false biblical worldviews that actually can lead to a disastrous life. So let's get started. And on the back of your bulletin, there's an opportunity to take some notes if you desire. And um, what I'm going to start with is this. A new Christian life leads us to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. If you are new in Christ, you have already experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. If you said, I believe in Jesus... If you were singing that song that we started off singing earlier, which is going to become a little bit of a credo during this series, by the way, if you can sing that song and say, I believe in Jesus Christ, I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, you've experienced the Holy Spirit in your life already because here's what Scripture says. In 1 Corinthians 12, 3, it says, no one can say that Jesus Christ is Lord except by the utterance of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has touched you in some way. Because you're not able to say on your own, by your own power, that I believe in Jesus Christ. That the Holy Spirit's been stirring you, empowering you, causing you, getting you to the place of saying that in your life. And so as we think about what we've done in the past, everything that we've ever done has been forgiven. We have a new life, a brand new perspective. Everything's been forgiven and forgotten all things are new in Christ. Jesus said this, in, or uh, Paul said this in Colossians 3, 9 about Jesus. You have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self. That's through Jesus, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of the creator. Jesus has given us that knowledge. Now, how does that happen? Ephesians, which I read from just a few moments ago, said, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Greek verb there actually is the indication of keep on being filled. It's not like I got that once and I don't need it again. It's like something that we, we pray happens to us daily. And so I need to uh, invite the Holy Spirit into my heart daily. I want you to do a little exercise with me. I, you've probably done this somewhere before, and if it's the first time, that's great. But let's just all take a breath and breathe out. <sighs> Okay, just feel like when you're doing that, you're breathing out the negativity, the, the sin, the darkness, the problem, the stress. Let's just do it again. And you breathe that stuff out. And then we say, let's take in a breath of fresh air. Let's take in a breath of God's love. And so let's take a deep breath in. And so, say this with me, and then take a deep breath. Say, come Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and breathe in. I'd like you this week to be thinking about doing that daily in your life. And here's why. This Sunday, next Sunday, next Sunday is Pentecost, the day that the Holy Spirit came upon the early church. Everything that the early church did was empowered by the Holy Spirit. They did nothing on their own. They always understood that it was Jesus' spirit around and in them and in the lives of those that they were speaking to that was making all the difference. They would speak the words, but it was the Holy Spirit doing the work. And so let's just do that again. Let's just breathe in and say, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. 
Would you do that every day this week as we prepare for Pentecost? The day when 3,000 people were first saved and the church was begun because the church was empowered by the Holy Spirit. What would it be like if we did that in our lives? What would, how would our worldview change if every morning we woke up and said, come Holy Spirit, come live in my life today. Take away the sin and the sorrow and the sadness and bring your forgiveness and hope and grace. Well, the second point on the back of that page is when I have a new life in Christ, I also begin to live my life as a disciple or to be disciplined by Christ. Those two words come from the same root, discipline and disciple. Uh, to learn, to follow, to maybe accept the worldview of, right? If, I, if someone is teaching me about what they believe about the world, about life, about God, I am beginning to receive their worldview, what they, how they look at the life, uh, how they look at life, what it means to them. Everything that we know about God what we believe about God has come through Jesus Christ. There's a lot of great stuff in the Old Testament, and of course that's the, that's the seedbed of faith for you know, Jesus' life himself. But as we view all of that, we view it through Jesus. Now listen to Romans 12. It says this, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. You're not going to do that. God is going to transform you. Then you'll know what God wants you to do, and you will know how good and pleasing and perfect His will really is. Well, how, how do we grow in discipling, being discipled or following Christ more fully with our life? The first of these, and these are not rock and science, you've heard these before, but let's get them out there as we begin this whole Walk the Talk series. The first thing is to grow in prayer, to speak to and to listen to God. If you're going to grow in your relationship with anyone, it begins with conversation. It begins with being in their presence at least, right? I mean, you don't necessarily have to talk, but to be in God's presence, to be listening for Him is also good. Um, my men's Wednesday morning study is going to begin something called Experiencing God this week. Guys, I'm just going to put in a shameless plug. If that's something you're interested in, we get up at 6 o'clock, there's usually donuts and you know, I mean, I think we heard about that this morning. If there's donuts, it's God time. And, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of experiencing God is all about getting into God's presence. And there's a, a, a little journey for you to go on daily to make that happen in your life. It's about listening for God's will. If you'd like to be a part of that, we come here at 6 in the morning and leave promptly at a good time. But here it is. It's about being in prayer. The second piece of that is also to to be fed by God's Word. You know, seven days without food makes one week, right? I mean, that whole thought that if we're not getting fed by God, we are growing weaker and weaker in our faith. And God's Word is that which feeds us and directs us and guides our minds, as, as Romans 12, 2 said. Thirdly, worshiping God. Um, let, me, let me go back to the, the story for just a moment on the last one. You know, we just got through with the story. And my question is for you, what's next? You know, the story was the last 32 weeks of our church's life. What does the next several weeks of your life look like? If you read through the story, I think that is awesome. Are you going back and reading through it again? Are you getting into a study with your small group? It's not like you're earning your way. But I will tell you, either you're progressing in your walk of faith or you're regressing. You're growing closer to God and hearing His Word, or you're falling away. You know, summertime isn't a time for falling off. Summertime is a time for the real growth. Watch the plants. That's the time that they really grow. This can be a time for you in your life where you can dig down deep into God's Word, maybe because you have a little bit more time. Thirdly, then worship God. Um, I was watching a, or a reading in Reader's Digest just the other day about animals that... Um, mimic human beings or act like humans, or is it vice versa? I think we have to ask sometimes. But the, um, there was this whale who had gotten caught in some netting, and some researchers or scientists or whatever went, and they freed the whale. And what did the whale do for the next hour? The whale 
was beside their boat, jumping up and down, showing them, uh, you know, this glory of the whale, all to give thanks to them. That's what they believed, that the whale was thanking them for what they had done for him. When you are in Christ and you know what God has done for you to forgive you for your sin, that you know guilt is gone and you are freed forever and that you can live forever. How can our souls help but jumping up and down like the whale and sharing God's glory with the world for the world to see? That's why God created us, for adoration and praise. And, and that's God gave you a spirit within you that wants to give him praise. And so when we don't get a chance to do that, when we don't do that with our, our life, we are not living a fulfilled life. Scripture says in John 10, it says, I came that you might have life and that you have, might have it abundantly. The abundant life, by the way, is the fulfilled life. And you are never more fulfilled than when you come close to God and when you are serving God. I want to bring up uh, three young people there, um, three members of our congregation, Gabe and Liz and Zach. And if you guys would come forward, and I've got a red and a yellow mic here. Gosh, I'm just going to grab a purple one as well, but since you got three of you guys, there's that for Liz, yellow-bellied, whatever. This is uh, my friend Zach, who's been in my office sometimes, <laughs> by the way. Uh, you might have seen that in a previous sermon near you. Um, but these guys are going off on to, uh, to a YWAM um, mission, and why don't you tell us your names and what you guys are doing, by the way? Yeah. I'm... That's a microphone. Yeah, yeah okay. Every time again. <laughs> Okay, so the fact that you've done the schooling means that it's higher than him. You're better than he is. Okay, all right, just getting that straight. All right. <laughs> Gabe. Okay, and so tell us a little bit about what you're going to be doing in uh, Nicaragua and in Germany. Gabe, uh, let's start with you on this next question. What, what caused you guys to want to do what you're doing? What, what's been the driving force for you in, in going into mission at this time of your life? And DTS is discipleship training, okay? Okay, God, I don't know what you're going to do, but I want to see it. So just seeing him come 
Hmm. Sorry? Yeah, uh, for me, he just kind of told me he was in Nicaragua. Uh, it was about six months ago. And, you know, I, I spent time in prayer with God, just kind of, you know, every day sometimes, you know, in a typical place, I'm just kind of going through life, and he just kind of told me to do it. And I was kind of like, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so it was really for me, I've never done anything like this, so it's just stepping out of faith and saying, all right, I don't know how you're going to do it, but okay, I'll go. Well, let, let me say it so you guys don't have to say it, but I know that uh, today um, they will be out there and you can visit with them. Uh, they're at Pastor Steve's class for a little bit as well today. You can catch them there or after that as well. They'll be out in the atrium. You can catch them after worship service, but um, they do have some funding needs, and if you're able to do that, I think what they've said to me is that just invite you to be in prayer, and whatever God leads you to, if that's you know, uh, for funding them or for just praying for them, whatever God is leading you to do, I think that's really important for them, and I think you guys are still trying to raise $6,000 to, to go. So we'll, we'll pray. Can, can I just pray for you guys before you go? Let's, um, let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for these, your servants, and what a blessing it is, oh God, to see their worldview in this moment of their life. God, encourage us as we see them go off into mission that you might use them for your glory, but Lord, also that you might teach us too and, and help us to get excited about mission because of what you're doing in their life. To you be the glory, Jesus, as they serve. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you give them a round of applause? Thank you. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> All right, so just because you are not going off into the mission field does not mean that you are not like something unworthy, but here's the deal is when we as the church start to have this sort of worldview that God is speaking to us and sending us, it happens to people. And you can be a part of that, whether you're a part of funding things like this, and you know, it requires money to do that, but but praying and, and be getting involved. And I, some of the great things as we've been partnering with some of these uh, folks going off in, in missions is to hear back and watch them in, their, in the letters they send and in and, and the little newsletters they send and how God is using them and touching lives of people. It's incredible what God does and speaks into the community as we start to look at what God's will is for us. I want to bring us to the third point today because when we are, are new in Christ, we also then embrace a kingdom vision. This is kingdom stuff. Um, that, you know, there's many choices that we have when we leave here today. The question is, how will we use this very one and only life that God has given us? I mean, what will we do with our time, with our money, with our efforts, with our experiences? God wants to use you for His glory. And the power is in his word and in prayer, and, and, and he will show you what that is for your life. Let me share a scripture with you that, uh, that comes there in uh, John, or Ephesians 3.10. It says, God's intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. What you do will affect the world, maybe even to the point of, of leaders and, and, and people of of foreign nations that you never thought you'd go to. I mean, a word to go to Nicaragua, I mean, where does that come from? I don't know. God speaks to us in ways that we don't even know. My worldview, my set of beliefs is what I base my life on. So how I view God, myself, um, my, uh, my world, how I view other people, how I view Satan, my thoughts about life and death and the past, present and future, that's all a part of my worldview. And so what I believe about pain and suffering, good and evil, are all affected by a worldview that I have. And today we're talking about embracing a kingdom vision. And so it affects how we, how we live our life in relationships, what we do with our time, what do we do with our money. You know, Forrest Gump said, and you can help me finish this, life is like you never know what you're going to get, right? I mean, and so Forrest Gump had a worldview. That was a, that's a worldview. 
uh, whether you believe the world is a race or a contest or whether it's a circus, that's a worldview with which you live your life. The question is, is how is that worldview affecting the choices you make and the experience of, of what the world is looking at Christians with? And God wants us to know that every time you make a choice, you are accessing your worldview, right? If, I, if I'm going to go and cross the street, I'm, a, I'm already looking to my worldview. I'm making a decision. How fast is that car going? Can I get across the street without getting hurt? You know, it depends on if Perry Fruling is driving the car or not, I guess. But, but this whole idea that I have already, I make thousands of choices a day based on a worldview that's been affected by parents, my peers, relationships that I have, whether at school, those in authority, media, all of that affects my worldview. And so here's what I want to get us started on, and we're going to get into this then in the next seven weeks in this series, is that we must understand false views of the world. We're going to talk about what some of those are next week. You've been told in the past all kinds of things about yourself. You've been told maybe, hey, um, you're not good at sports, or you're not good at math, or you're not good at this or that, you're awkward, you're shy, somebody has told you things about you, and maybe they're false, or maybe they're true, but you have bought them, you believe them, and now you're living on them. And and I'm not only talking about things about yourself and what you're good at or not, it's what you view about life itself. And so we need to then finally, to begin living out a biblical worldview. What would that look like if we lived based on what is real, what is true? You know, you're not forced to make any decision about your worldview. God isn't forcing you to make any decision. But when you look at God's, the world from God's perspective and and start to act on God's worldview, things change. And it can be disastrous without it. I do want to share with you that this uh, series is based on some talks, uh, some writings, some sermons even by um, three people. One is Chuck Colson, who's the founder of Fellowship of Prison Ministries. Uh, The other, Rick Warren, who you know is is from Saddleback, Purpose Driven Life, which our church did many years ago. The third person, you may not know his name. His name is Gerard Long. I didn't know his name before this series, but he is the president of Alpha USA, and I want to introduce him to him for just a quick moment. Um, I was driving across uh, the state of Illinois about three weeks ago, and I was picking up our daughter Ashley from Indiana University, and I was listening to uh, Chicago radio stations. I was looking for the Cubs game. They weren't on, so I had to settle for some news, some Chicago news, and Um, What I heard was a news bulletin come across and that a young lady had been uh, pulled from Lake Michigan. Body had been found. And um, in the moment I, you know, was listening, you know, how she had been flailing in the water by the time the emergency people got to her uh, and brought her in, she was dead. And I, you know, was affected by that sort of as I was driving across in the state of Illinois and thinking, oh, you know, big city, you know, and all that. And and then I came home and I was here for a couple of days and um, uh, Jesse came into my office and he mentioned that uh, Gerard Long's daughter had died recently. She had do- died in a drowning accident in Chicago. And I said, when was that? And here it had been the same person had died. It's, her name is Rebecca Long. She had been in the head of the Alpha uh, Youth Program for the United States. Just a passionate young person, full of life and energy. And she had gone for a swim after running and had cramped up in the cold waters and had not made it. So I listened to the live streaming of the funeral. Knowing that we were going into the series, I I wanted to learn more about this family and their faith. And I want to share with you just a, I think it's a minute and a half clip of Gerard Long himself speaking at his daughter's funeral. I could never do this, but I want you to hear the faith and the passion that's in his life. Take a listen.
How can a person say we have great hope in the midst of tragedy like that, in the midst of sadness and, and difficulty to be able to proclaim love and hope and grace? It all comes down to one thing. It's his worldview. What he not only believes about his salvation, but what he believes about everything that happens to him in his life. Not only about his beliefs, but about what he says and does and how he lives. I hope this next seven weeks for you rattles and shakes your world. Because as I've gotten into this, it's rattling and shaking me and reminding me that God calls us into this relationship that is powerful, fueled by the Holy Spirit, because you can't change yourself, but God can, and God will. As we open and listen and renew our minds, as that Romans 12 passage said, letting Christ do that.